to start off with, um, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, a great deal of um, uh, renaissance and uh, reinvigoration of labor market uh, immigration has taken place uh, in Western Europe, and that started roughly around the turn of the 21st um, century. Um, that is to say that in a number of Western European countries, um, the um, idea bubbled back to the forefront that it would be advisable to try to actively recruit uh, labor market migration. We might take that for granted now because I think it's fair to say that a number of European countries, not just in, in the West, have um, dusted off their considerations of migration policy. Uh, but back then, it, that was still a relatively controversial position to take, especially because the uh, first wave of post-World War II um, guest worker migrants in um, the Germanic um, European countries and the um, post-colonial migrants in countries like France and, and Britain um, um, uh, arrived in the 50s and 60s, um, spawning some degree of political conflict. And then, of course, the decision was taken after the first oil shock in 73, 74 uh, to end that phase of active labor migration altogether. And at the time, it was assumed that that would be um, a permanent decision in the migration scholarship. The assumption was also always that this particular constellation of factors in the uh, post-war decades would never return. Uh, in other words, they would never again be a phase of active labor market. Uh, recruitment. And that turned out to be false. Um, uh, I and my uh, co-authors have tried to uh, explore the reasons why um, that Renaissance um, came about in Britain, um, then um, somewhat belatedly also um, in Germany and later in the Netherlands, and little by little throughout um, Western Europe. And we pointed to um, the um, lobbying strategies of employer uh, organizations, that is to say, um, we pointed towards the role that organized business played, acknowledging, however, that occasionally it was a story of pushing at an open door. That's to say, um, in particular, the um, governments of uh, Tony Blair in Britain and later uh, Gerhard Schröder in Germany were um, it required relatively little by way of convincing. They were already um, very favorably inclined towards um, rediscovering uh, labor migration. And the argument um, that I made at the time was that um, the different varieties of capitalism um, shaped the lobbying strategies of the employers. So in that sense, employers didn't just simply want more labor, a bigger pool of um, migrants, but um, they did pay very close attention to what sort of migrants might um, possibly be attracted. And they attempted to recruit immigrants that would fit their political economy particularly well. Uh, some somewhat crude terms that meant that in the liberal market economies such as the United Kingdom and Ireland, there was less attention being paid to um, skills simply because um, effectively in a liberal market economy, um, we don't really have the much more complex institutionalized systems of vocational training um, that exist in coordinated market economies. And consequently, um, people are much more likely to be trained on the job um, formal qualifications are not as highly regarded as they might be in, in other uh, systems of political economy. So the British and the Irish in that sense wanted numbers, but they were um, not as worried about um, diplomas, degrees, formal qualifications, or anything of the nature. And in coordinated market economies, it um, is a very different story because uh, the, the labor market is quite highly uh, regulated, as is uh, the educational system, and consequently, um, unskilled labor is not really something that employers are terribly excited about. Um, they also have to worry about politicization and what a large scale uh, unskilled immigration might mean for the um, domestic debate. But um, more narrowly, um, these are individuals that are relatively difficult to employ and slot into a labor market, which pays a great deal of attention to formal qualifications. And, and skills levels. And in the mixed market economies, we have a, a somewhat uneasy mixture of the two. That is to say, um, the countries such as uh, Italy and um, uh, France do, of course, have, um, at least in some regions, a quasi um, Germanic system of coordinated market economies style vocational system. But they also, of course, have large scale undocumented elements of their labor market. And they also have. Um, um, a much more um, fluid, unskilled segment of the labor market. So it is a, a somewhat uneasy mixture of the two, and consequently, the employers 
um, were not as outspoken because it was very hard to formulate a co coherent and cogent um, strategy behind the backdrop of such a country. Um, what I and we wanted to do at the time was, was move away a little bit from the um, sort of literature, um, which, um, for example, um, Stephen Castles and others um, spawned back in the 1970s, which was still somewhat um, shaped by neo-Marxist um, considerations in the uh, claim back then was that essentially capital wants more labor as a classic um, Marxist um, thinking. Essentially, um, there was a class effort here to weaken the role of labor and undermine um, the organized power of labor by using immigration essentially as a um, uh, strategic tool. If you read Marx or if you read Engels, of the conditions of the working class in England, that's exactly the argument he makes about and the use of the Irish in 19th century England. Um, we said it's not quite as simple as that. It's not just um, labor, but it's particular forms of labor that are being attracted um, to certain um, systems of political economy and employers don't just want more labor, they want particular uh, kinds of immigrants. Um, we, um, as we moved into um, the uh, 1990s and then the 2000s, um, witnessed um, in the wake of this renaissance of labor migration, also um, a turn towards um, rediscovering internal EU migration. That was, of course, probably not a novelty <laughs> speaking in front of a Polish audience. That is to say, the idea was in um, liberal market economies such as the United Kingdom and Ireland uh, to open up the labor market immediately after EU eastward enlargement in 2004. Um, and um, very much uh, take in labor migrants from Central and Eastern Europe as part of the strategy um, towards uh, labor recruitment. Um, the um, response elsewhere in Europe was a bit uh, more uh, circumspect, and this, of course, is um, part and parcel of the considerations regarding um, skill levels and regarding employability that I um, alluded to earlier. The um, employers um, are interested uh, in labor immigration in part because of um, an argument around skill shortages. And I hasten to add that it is an argument. It is not necessarily a scientific fact. It is a claim. Um, flexibility, which is a, a somewhat loaded term, that's to say we know that that is often uh, a somewhat coded way of describing um, the um, perhaps greater willingness of labor migrants to accept working conditions against which uh, native workers might push back. So flexibility is, is a somewhat, somewhat loaded term that uh, entails a number of assumptions. Um, and um, employers, especially in the labor market economies, also use labor migration as an alternative to um, automation and rolling out and greater automation um, instead. In um, the uh, days of the 2000s and the 2010s, I think it was um, still possible um, to remain wedded to the received wisdom, which was that essentially employers care about labor migration policy, but they don't really get themselves involved in political debates about other forms of legal migration. Um, that was because they have relatively little to gain and relatively uh, speaking quite a lot to lose if they should choose to do so. Other forms of migration um, are very politicized, they're very politically contested. Um, there are a lot of technocratic decision-making processes into which employers cannot possibly get involved. Uh, the decision as to whether or not to bestow asylum status, for example, is usually not a political one, it's a legal one. Um, and consequently, um, that is something that employers decided, um, for the most part, not um, to get themselves involved in. They stood uh, a considerable political risk. Uh, by getting themselves entangled into these sort of debates without really seeing an immediate payoff in terms of actually um, getting their voice heard. And one of the motivations behind um, this paper was to um, 
probe uh, that received wisdom a little bit and to question whether that claim still holds. Because of course, um, as we all know as migration researchers, um, labor migration in Europe is really a relatively small portion of the total pie of migration. Um, so if we're talking about debates around labor migration, we're talking about a relatively a small minority of legal immigrants. Um, the vast number of individuals who arrive uh, legally in Europe are would-be asylum seekers or beneficiaries of family or chain migration. So quantitatively, these two channels dwarf labor migration. Is it then still possible to simply essentially, as, as an employer association, as the voice of organized people, ignore enormous pools of migrants? And the traditional answer was yes. Very little employers can do. But I wondered whether that really is still um, the case today. And the argument that I'm making um, here this morning is that, in fact, it isn't. Employers are starting to depart to new shores. They are starting to become more outspoken on other forms of migration. And they get themselves involved into, um, you might say, much muddier waters. Um, the argument I also make is that the fundamental logic has not changed, that is to say political economy models still play a role. And what I wanted to do for this paper was to depart a little bit from um, varieties of capitalism, which is by now more than 20 years old, and um, apply the um, new growth models um, literature, which I'll speak about later on in the talk, um, developed um, around um, researchers at the Max Planck Institute in Cologne, um, Solucio Bajaro in particular, and apply that um, to the issue of not directly related um, to labor migration, but still legal forms of immigration. Um, and these um, growth models, so-called, um, try to make sense of the overall political economy strategy in various European countries. Um, according to this classification scheme, the United Kingdom and Germany, which are the two countries that I'll be focusing on today, are respectively consumption-led, that is to say, and their economy is primarily spiraled forward through domestic consumption. And um, the um, export-oriented model, these researchers identify with Germany, that is to say, the economy is primarily targeted towards the promotion of foreign exports. And uh, with that in mind, of course, um, employers in these two growth models take seriously the parameters of these models in terms of how that translates into their demands for migration policy. Um, <clears throat> the um, trouble with them, um, getting out of your lane a little bit, if you will, that is to say the trouble with them um, uh, moving out of labor migration primarily and um, moving into um, other issues and lobbying um, for um, policy around uh, politics other than labor migration is that if you do that, um, you are um, entering territory which is more legalistic. As I said earlier, asylum policy tends to be, yes, politically regulated, but individual asylum positions, of course, are, are not taken by politicians. Um, there is also um, the trouble that is um, extremely political and difficult to shape uh, poker debates around family reunion rights, right? So, um, children, um, parents, other relatives of legal migrants, and their migration rights are um, usually legally codified. Um, these legal regulations, of course, follow policy, so that can be politically altered but it is a very, very um, difficult form of um, politics and thus it's, it's not very, uh, in some sense, not very easy terrain to enter into. But even so, employers are starting to do that. Um, and the um, issue empirically that I looked at was to do with the issue of, um, admittedly, maybe somewhat technocratic example, the issue of child benefits um, for um, migrants from EU countries, that is to say. Um, what sort of um, benefits are legal EU immigrants eligible for for their children? Right? Can they take up the child benefit when they come to Britain or Germany? Um, and if so, are they eligible for the full whack of child benefits or only some kind of 
secondary reduced level of child benefit. So that is what interested me. And again, on the face of it, we would assume that this is, this is the sort of thing that um, employer associations don't really concern themselves with. Right? It's relatively technocratic, it's relatively narrow, it's highly politicized, um, especially in Germany. And it is also um, an issue which is, you might say, one step removed from pure labor migration. But the argument I'm trying to make is that, nevertheless, this is something that employers are, are um, finding it worth their time and effort to get involved in. And indeed, prior to Brexit, which of course has changed the game entirely in the United Kingdom, um, the um, British employers in, made a stance in a political climate that was not altogether amenable, to use a stronger language, um, in order to push for full eligibility for child benefit according to British standards for all legal migrants from the European Union to the United Kingdom. Um, I say that because um, this issue, as indeed it was also the case in Germany, became very, very politicized. There were allegations that um, immigrants were um, abusing the British welfare state, were excessively reliant on benefits, and were um, in some sense playing clever games so as to maximize their eligibility. The British employers said, um, uh, notwithstanding the fact that there might be individual cases of abuse, it is nevertheless important um, to have legal EU migrants here be eligible um, for the full um, child benefit for their children um, in um, terms of full eligibility. And in so doing, um, send out an important sign that EU labor migrants are welcome. Um, sent out an important sign that it is irrelevant as to how skilled or perhaps unskilled um, these EU migrants are. And um, they are in, nevertheless um, to be welcomed. And in so doing, in some sense, you might say the growth model consideration of trying to raise the levels of domestic consumption were maintained. If you look at the German case, it's a, a different story. In Germany, the issue became also um, a matter of a great deal of political debate. Um, and here in particular, it must be mentioned that um, one of the um, rallying points around this was that a number of um, EU migrants were taking up um, child benefits, even though a great deal of them um, did not actually bring their children to Germany. And that, of course, raised the question um, just how many children they actually had and whether all these children actually existed. Um, so um, it became um, much, much more of a contested issue than perhaps in Britain. But even so, of course, um, the question arose, what position, if any, German employers should take on the, on the matter? And German employers decided to take an, a different um, stance, a more restrictive one when compared to their British counterparts. They proposed limiting eligibility um, to um, children that are physically resident in Germany. So if you're Romanian and you come to Germany and you claim you have found five children, you're, um, of course, uh, welcome to make that claim. But if those five children continue to reside back home in Romania, you cannot, you cannot draw on, on the child benefit. That's what the German employer said. And they said that because they were worried that if um, the benefit would be seen as being um, too generous, perhaps too inviting, it would send out a political message that they did not wish to send out, namely that all forms of immigrants were to be welcomed. That is to say, their consideration was that um, a child benefit that would be limited to physical residency would still provide sufficient incentive for skilled EU migrants that they wanted but it might possibly deter precisely the kind of immigrants they were not interested in, namely unskilled immigrants. That was their, their rationale, their decision-making um, matrix. Um, there's also, um, in terms of empirics, the case of asylum. And I said earlier that this was something employers did not want to get themselves involved in. It's fairly messy, it's very politicized. Um, it's something where, as I mentioned earlier, it's very hard to move the needle, as it were. It's very hard to change the matrix anyway. Um, you have a lot to lose there, and ostensibly relatively little to gain. So why get involved? Because it is so important numerically in quantity terms. So it's, it's such, a, such an enormous pool of de facto legal migration. 
Um, here too, the question arose how to position yourself as an employer on the issue, what issue, if any, sorry, what stance, if any, should you take? And the British employer said, um, let's give asylum seekers full employment rights while their dossier is still under examination. So from the moment they come to Britain, they legally um, uh, lodge a, a claim for public asylum, they should be entitled to work right away. Bearing in mind right, that asylum seekers come in all shapes and, and forms of colors. Some of them are very skilled, others are not skilled at all. Some of them are barely literate. Some of them are PhDs in engineering and in medicine. Right? So we have, we have the whole gamut of skill levels there. But the British employer said, irrespective of their skill levels, um, they should all be legally employable. Um, interestingly, if you look at the position of the German employers, again, it very much follows the growth models um, strategy that say German employers said, um, let's, let's forget about full employment rights right away. But however, what we should be doing is uh, being supportive for those asylum seekers that make an effort to start to integrate themselves into the German labor market. So if we have asylum seekers that are in, in, the, train, in the vocational training system or at university, who are gathering the skills necessary to integrate themselves into a coordinated market economy style labor market, then these individuals should be eligible for, for grants from the government and for the BAFUC. But um, what we don't want is a, a, British, a British style um, free for all. We don't want um, full employment rights right away. That, that, that is probably too generous and it might um, or it has a kind of immigration magnet and send out a message that all are welcome, which is problematic because we won't be able to um, integrate low-skilled immigrants into, into our labor market. And so the logic in that sense um, of that lobbying strategy in both countries followed very much the growth model considerations. Right? In the British system, in a way, it doesn't really matter whether asylum seekers are skilled or not, because we will still be able to slot them into the labor market um, in some capacity or other. In the German style system, it is very important that um, individuals, asylum seekers or otherwise, are trained and skilled because otherwise they will most likely become a liability and they become very, very hard to integrate. Um, so um, in um, that sense of what I'm arguing is that employers are starting to become more assertive and more outspoken on um, issues that are only indirectly related um, to economic migration. They are starting to broaden their remit of activities, focusing also on immigrants that are arriving um, in different legal channels. Um, and they are doing that um, partially um, out of necessity, partially simply for pragmatic reasons. The number of legal migrants that arrive as non, as, sorry, as, as non economic migrants, yes, are um, is much, much higher than those arriving as um, um, labor migrants in the first instance. So, so for that reason, it, it makes a great deal of sense to develop a strategy on these issues because they're become so, uh, becoming so present. And um, it, it is precisely this what um, employers are starting to do. Um, I also argue that the um, uh, growth models approach, which um, draws on the work of Kalecki, who was um, a contemporary of John Maynard Keynes, but I think it's a lot less well known um, in um, the world of academia and beyond, could benefit from incorporating considerations of immigration, which is currently um, not the case. So when Jonas Pontesen and Lucio Bacao uh, developed their growth models uh, strategy approach a few um, years ago, um, they were interested in looking at the role of trade unions, interested in the role of employer associations, interested in product markets, product market regulations, and the overall strategy countries in Europe used to develop economic growth. But they didn't really um, spend a great deal of time focusing on immigration considerations. And um, in my considered view, that is somewhat of a lacuna, and that is something that could be added to uh, the growth models um, approach to make it um, more compelling and to add that element um, to labor market considerations. Okay, um, so uh, to sum up the um, argument that I developed in this paper is that um, 
the received wisdom according to which employer associations focus on labor migration only is by now somewhat outdated. Employers are starting to um, um, broaden their remit a little bit. They are starting to get involved also into other forms of legal migration. They're starting to get interested in um, lobbying with respect to legal channels of migration that historically they stayed away from for reasons I outlined. Um, that um, said, it is to a certain degree possible to predict the kind of lobbying strategies that employers embedded in different systems of political economy will pursue. It's not just a matter of willy-nilly, essentially just waving in immigrants or uh, from, you might say, more neo-Marxist perspectives of saying all uh, labor is good because you have a much broader labor pool and a much broader labor pool means weaker labor, it means weaker unions, it me means labor acquiescence um, towards working conditions to um, wage moderation, etc. All that essentially was already described by, by uh, Engels in um, the context of 19th century England and the use of uh, Irish um, migrant labor in those days. No, it's, it's a matter of um, these different growth models and their strategy conditioning the demands that employers make. And the demands that employers make um, have to do with considerations of employability and skills. They want um, migrants, but they want migrants that um, are complementary um, to their respective model of the economy, that are employable, that can be easily um, uh, integrated into the labor market, that don't become a liability, that are not difficult to integrate. And for that reason, um, British employers are still much more liberal in the traditional sense of the term. Um, they are um, more interested in um, all um, skill levels of immigrants. Um, that is reflected in their strategy vis-a-vis um, -vis the first empirical case that I uh, introduced you to, that is to say the issue of child benefits for you migrants by now. Of course, unfortunately, that is um, somewhat of historical value only in the British context for obvious reasons. Um, and the issue of the asylum seekers, which is very much still um, a pressing issue. And in the German cases, it's a slightly different story. Um, the German employers were much more um, conservative and you might say somewhat more restrictive with regards to the issue of child benefits because they saw a potential problem there of abuse, but they also saw a potential problem there of essentially sending a wrong message, and sending a message that might be misinterpreted and might be um, interpreted as an invitation for immigrants from EU countries that would be difficult to um, employ in the labor market. Um, and similarly with regards to asylum, um, if you think back to that second empirical case study that I um, briefly sketched, um, here too, um, German employers don't uh, want immediate employment rights that would be too too liberal for their flavor. Um, what they do, however, are favorably, uh, what they are favorably inclined towards is supporting those asylum seekers that make an effort towards making themselves employable by um, undergoing vocational training or by uh, pursuing a university degree. Because that means that they will be, assuming they receive this asylum status, they will be much easier to employ once they're done with their studies. So that is um, the um, case I wanted to make here in front of you this morning. And uh, we do have oodles of time. <laughs> so I'm opening up the floor and I'm happy to take uh, questions from the audience, either the physical audience or the virtual audience via Zoom. Thank you.